I think what I want to do is get into the context. Uh, the, the, the stuff I've been doing for about the past 15 years or so is really building business plans and, and helping <coughs> organizations, large as in multi-billion dollar communications companies and small as in one-man band just setting up small businesses. The framework, the models, everything I go through, very pragmatic approach, um, and it applies equally across whatever size of organization I've worked with. Okay, so the kind of things I want to really look at is, you know, is building the business model itself. So the business model, but really coming from, you know, as Richard was saying, really now you've got to the stage where you actually decide this is going to be your business plan. So you're going to r write your business plan. Lots of terrific stuff um, to, to get to that point. But this point now you can actually build out that business plan, what goes in it and why. Some of the crucial things, what do you build, what do you buy and what do you partner with? Um, and I want to get to uh, a couple of examples of those things as to um, you know, where I think it's really worth focusing. Um, a bit about the value proposition. I'll go through a few examples and actually, you know, some some tools that, uh, that I've used consistently to actually make those um, very real and to actually differentiate um, um, products, services, offerings. Um, so how does that then fit into the competitive landscape? Um, and really, uh, back to the point as well. How do you build adaptive products and services? Because one thing that is certain is that change will happen. Um, and and how do you build to take that into account? Um, how does that then all f affect the budget? When building a budget, why are you building the budget? Who's looking at it? And what's the, the main purpose and the key elements you need to get out of that? Um, some advice for attracting investors. Uh, as Kathleen said, I worked with PricewaterhouseCoopers. We, we used to see a lot of investors looking at businesses. Um, I've actually sat in on a number of those investor um, pieces myself um, to actually help organizations uh, who are looking for, for funding, as well as being on the other side, judging whether they will or will not get funding. Um, and, and then I want to go through some examples of business models, some, some practical examples, lots of different categories around different ways of maybe looking at exactly the same market that everybody else is looking at, but approaching it in a different way. Uh, again, with some very pragmatic examples. Um, uh, and then the, the one that I really want to emphasize um, is the importance of pricing and the difference that that can make to the final business plan and the business model. Um, you know, even to the point of a go, no go decision on a business as to what pricing can actually have on the uh, on the impact and finally defining what success will look like might look terribly complicated in that but once you get to the business plan from any business I've ever seen as long as you covered all this kind of stuff you've basically got a business plan in place starting from the market context and that market context is what's happening in the market that you're talking about and lots of different ways of doing it so like all of the stuff you just heard before actually having gone through that but explaining what is happening in that market once you've got a description as to what's happening in that market, anything you're doing within that market is going to have to be relevant to what's happening out there. So it's very much a, that is what's happening rather than I'm the one that's going to be affecting it. Um, in some cases, by you know, maybe an apple as an example, um, that, that was it. but what's happening in the market by really understanding what are consumers doing, what's the changes, you know, political, economic, social, what are the changes that are happening there that I am going to map to. From that, defining your objectives, your vision and your strategy as a result of that. And the bit I want to get to there is that that's going to relate to the blueprint plan that's at the bottom there. Okay, so underneath the objectives and strategy, once you've, you know, this is what we're trying to achieve, by when, how much. Within that is what are my products and what are my customers, and it's very deliberately set side to side next to each other. These are my customers, these are my products and services, yeah, and that those things need to match, and the value propositions need to be making sense. That the value proposition I've got to hit those customers with, with these products and services, makes sense. Underneath all of that, all of my organization's capabilities, billing, IT, marketing, everything else that's going to go to support it. And underneath that comes the financial plan. So when you do all that and you actually get your spreadsheet, which then looks like it doesn't make any money, that's time to go back and start again. And you can just keep going around it. So that the business plan itself, once all of that makes sense, underneath it, you then have a timeline plan. And that blueprint, typically three to five years, seeing them 10 years or more, much larger, more stable organizations because the payback period is longer. But that all needs to make sense. So that, that quantification basically equates to the future state. That's where we're going to be five years out. And here's how we're going to go from where we are now to where we're going to get to there. And the reason there's lots of little lines and wiggles there is because that's the change that happens in the middle. If this happens, then we will do this. But that's how we're going to cope with it. Overall, the business plan needs to capture that. And it's who's that for. If that is going to 
internally in large organizations. Typically, that's a model that we follow so that people can understand where the budgets are going to be allocated. Externally, when going to venture capitalists, angel investors, they still want to see the same thing. How is that all going to be achieved? Albeit that the way of packaging it and telling the messages may well be different, but that's we'll get to some examples of some of those things and, and who's looking for, for what information. But overall, having done that and having done that for, as I said, multi-billion dollar organizations as well as one-man bands, capturing it all within that kind of framework seems to work. When putting the business plan together is to really look at that strategic alliances, partnerships. What do you make, what do you build, and what do you buy? Typically, the business plans I've seen, they go too far into doing it itself. And it's really only at the, if you see the matrix on the left-hand side there, things of high strategic importance and where you have high competence, those are the things you should be making. Typically, I've seen organizations and individuals going way into the detail of things that are actually of low strategic importance and spending far too much time and effort on things that, quite frankly, you can either buy or have somebody else do for you. And that business plan is stronger as a result of being more specific and more focused on what we're doing. And we have a whole different way of doing that. Strategic alliances or you know, licensing, you know, whatever the, the strength of that relationship needs to be. But the overall business plan, because when you get right into the bits where you are most competent, where you're performing better than anybody else can in that high strategic value, and actually those things that are more commoditized are things that you're buying in, you get stronger relationships and you can then start getting um, you know, better prices and better performance out of the people that you're working with. Uh, and the business plan typically looks stronger as a result of that. Add on to the value proposition. Most important thing about this is first defining what market you're in. Okay, once you've defined the market segment, then you can get to the value proposition, and that's the most important thing about it. So just defining that as automobiles is no use. If, however, you are looking at the luxury car segment, whatever it happens to be, um, you know, Mercedes, BMW, and Audi, and how do you then you know, position yourself within there? And the, the point about this one is that the further away from the center you get, the more defined into the segment that you are, the better your value proposition is likely to be. So if you are focusing on being the best quality in that segment, way out on the left-hand side, then that's where your focus will be. If you're being the best value, um, some may see that as low, lowest price, but uh, whatever way you happen to define it, the further you can get into those segments, the stronger that value proposition is likely to be. And it's really about defining that segment, what what is your market segment? What are you dealing with? Once you've got in there and you can then start plotting where everybody else is playing, you can see whether there's an opportunity and a large enough gap for you to be actually being able to, to um, compete effectively. And if we take, we won't keep picking on BlackBerry, but if you take where they happened to be with the tablet when it came out, it was pretty much not doing anything different. The, the iPad very much came into the must-have. It was must-have, able to you know, pretty much dominate his own segment, um, people paying way more for that than other things that seemingly could do the same thing, but it was a must-have device. Whereas when the playbook came out, it, it kind of didn't fit in there. And that's again, once you've got right the way through, and if you actually say, what segment are we in? You know, how is that going to be in one of those segments much more defined than something else? How are you then going to compete effectively? Having done that for that offering, in that segment is to then go down the fundamentals of good segmentation. Make sure you know how to measure how well you're doing in there. Make sure it's big enough, so sizable. Make sure you can actually get to it. You can get to that market in a cost-effective way and that that market will last long enough for the, the length of time that you're planning on being there. Okay, so that it's durable enough. Once you've got all that, you can then build your marketing message around that. And if the business plan can explain that very simply, very elo eloquently, people can pick it up and think, Okay, I've got that. Why are you different? How big is this market? How are you going to compete effectively in there? And yeah, it's going to last long enough to make the money back. So what I want to do in competitive landscape, and I was thinking about lots of different ways of doing this, but I just can't do that for my own business, my own consulting business. Whatever your business is, whatever segment you're operating in, is try and get that map. You'll know that better than anybody else will know it. And it's, it is quite important just defining and drawing your own that relates directly to what it is that your business or your offering is, is determined to do. So for me, for example, I'm not competing with McKinsey and all that kind of strategy, consulting and people deciding which business to be in. And again, I'm not trying to compete with Accenture in terms of a technology platform there. I'm trying to bridge that gap between where people in the big four, the PricewaterhouseCoopers of the world, um, where I used to work, between them and the strategy. When organizations have defined the strategy of what business to be in before they go to implementation, that's where my business operates. That's where I come in. And that's how I, you know, very focused in there, very much on digital, 
I, I, I look around, you know, digital, mobile, all of that area, have my expertise in there, that's where I'm focused. That's what my offering is. And it's really important to have that competitively positioned because your clients will pick up on, on that, customers pick up on that, being able to understand very clearly where it is that you fit. This part, to me, is, is it's kind of like it's the, the whole nub of where it's all going in the business plan. It's about then turning the business plan into what your customers, consumers, whoever they happen to be, will see. And that's about putting it into active offerings, which are target, targeted and focused. And the more specific it can be, the more tangible it is around, I can see that's the product that that client is getting at that price of whatever it happens to be with that value, value proposition. That's how it then turns the business plan into being something that you can then put a financial plan around. And the financial plan, the key part here, that we try to do is to get here's the product and service offering this is how long it's going to take for that product to get to market and here's all the operational costs all the marketing everything else that's going to go to it and this is when the revenue starts in and from a funding point of view what you're really looking at is when the peak revenue projection but all, in fact most important will be what's the maximum funding requirement? what's the peak funding requirement so when I was working with a, um, a property organization in sort of Eastern Europe they were actually looking at a couple of these large condo developments, total price of doing so was around 20, 25 million dollars. It was in that sort of range. But the way that it worked there, which is not dissimilar here, is that before you actually get funding to go ahead, you need to have at least 70% sold before you can put one shovel in the ground. And in that particular market, anybody buying off there also gets the revenue up front from their, the mortgage that they would be receiving, 20% up front. And by being explaining to the investors that what you're really looking for is $2.5 million, not $25 million before they have a, a, you know, any kind of outlook, it really helped in getting that funding agreed and getting it ahead by saying, this is where the peak funding will be, that's your maximum exposure, and what have you bought up to then? And quite frankly, it was only about 10% of that, so it was around $200,000, not $2.5 million, before they would be able to pull the plug. So the risk exposure on a $25 million um, project was actually $200,000. And, uh, and explaining that was crucial to the funding being agreed. Uh, you know, and it's being able to get those kind of numbers you know, sorted around you know, each of those offerings. That's one particular offering that then sits in there. And so how does that then stack up so that the business plan explains what that risk exposure is?